So with PQ season starting this weekend, here is my top eight tips and tricks for you to instantly improve at Flesh and Blood. I'm Tog and welcome to We Make Best. So first off, we have Know Your Role. To win Flesh and Blood games, you must make decisions that build towards a goal and knowing your role informs those decisions. So in a game where every hand you draw has 81 different possible ways to play it, knowing our role helps us know which one or two of these possibilities is the correct decision. And so how you find your role is by identifying which axis you need to be playing for at any given moment. The two main metrics I use for this is first life, aka racing, or value, aka grinding. I use these metrics because a player that is able to simultaneously outrace and outvalue the other over an entire game will win that game 100% of the time, no matter what. To give an example, let's look into a game of Fire versus Hatchet Dory. So while Fire has the clear advantage in the race aspect, the Dory then needs to identify what cards they need to obtain value throughout the game in order to keep up with the Fire. So the cards of interest for both decks would be Art of War and Mask of Pouncing Links for Fire to maximize their racing potential, while Dory should be looking to get as much value as they can from their power cards like Spill Bloods, Blade Flurries, Defense Reacts, and their Valiant Dynamos. And just like that, we've figured out the key cards and both players' roles within a matchup just by measuring it using those metrics that I stated before. So try that out for yourself with your own decks against any other matchup that you can think of. But the next tip we have is sideboard well, don't over sideboard. So a perfect follow up to our previous know your role tip because sideboarding becomes a million times easier when you understand your roles for each matchup. The first questions I like to ask myself when choosing what I need to sideboard for is what matchups do I need help with and what am I likely to face? When I have this figured out, I move into specific cards. So let's get into what I personally think about when sideboarding. First off, equipment has the highest priority in my opinion. First, because they only cost one slot as opposed to three slots for a card going into your deck. Second, because you'll have access to them every single turn from the start of the game meaning they are guaranteed to affect the games that you bring them in. There's no worse feeling than bringing in a three of sideboard piece into a matchup and then you simply don't draw into them. Then you're asking yourself, why am I using three slots in my sideboard? Making equipment an effective and safer option. After that, I tend to lean towards the cards that are great into multiple matchups. So of course, there's a the generic ones like CNC and Sink Below, but I think people forget that we're playing in an internal format and there's actually a lot more options that people forget about. A couple of my favorite ones are Out Muscle as a great choice into Warriors, Dromai, and Kano. Down and Dirty as a popper for Illusionists, but also helps with Codex of Frailty decks. Ripple Away is another great option for decks like KO, Dromai, Codex, and debatably good if you need extra blues into Kano. Amnesia for Prism, Katsu, Vincent, etc. Humble into almost every single top deck in the meta right now. And then to end off this tip, I always urge people to try and stay away from sideboard cards for matchups that you're already favored into. These cards often turn your 60% matchup into a 70%, but that slot could instead be used for something that turns a 40% matchup into a 50% instead. And having this mindset for choosing your sideboard cards will bring you a lot of consistency, and that consistency is what you need in order to win big tournaments like your ProQuest. Now the next tip, this one is where it gets a little bit interesting and maybe even controversial, so I want people's opinions on this. But in my opinion, I think players tend to over-index on getting the best math every turn. And what this has done is, I'd say something like 95% of the player base only think on a turn by turn basis instead of the game holistically. To give an example of what I mean, I recently had a coaching session where we were reviewing our game together and in this game, I was able to get a decent lead against him early. So he was behind looking for a way to claw back into the game. But then there was a turn where I sent a CNC and he had an Arsenal D-React. So it was by far the best math to double block, save his Arsenal and then return with a good two card hand. But the problem was the one of the cards that he had to block with was a power card that I believed was his only win con from that position. And so although his line was good mathematically, it wasn't the winning line. In hindsight, the correct line was to either one or no blocks that turn, 
let your Arsenal die and try to set up that power card in Arsenal while maintaining some tempo in order to create space for that power turn. And then in that session, he asked me how could he spot this type of line in his games on his own? And I didn't really have an answer for him back then, but thinking back on it, I'd now say this. Don't ask yourself what's your best numbers with this hand. Instead, ask, how do I win? Asking yourself this question tells you how to deviate from this math mindset that most of the fab player base are locked into and instead see when you're meant to take these harder to see lines, even at the cost of some of your math. So yeah, pretty weird concept that one. Would love people's opinions on it. But to go off of that one, we have tip number four, which is don't try to beat the nut draws. So even though fab has easily the least amount of RNG factors in it out of all TCGs, it is still a card game at the end of the day, so there definitely is some variance to it. With that in mind though, to be able to maximize our win equity every game, we need to stop trying to play around everything. When players try to play around everything, they often give up equity in an already winnable game in order to chase an unwinnable one. Instead, use the matchup or the game state as a guide to tell you how much you can afford to play around. To give an example, when I'm favored, I tend to play around 90% of my opponent's range since I can afford to lose a point or two of value just to make sure my opponent can't come back into the game without a hyper-specific answer. Whereas if I'm behind, I won't play around shit because you'll need to get lucky to win those games anyway. If I had to give an in-game example of this is in the Kano versus Agro matchups. It's common, even at the larger tournaments, that players become scared to tap out, even for an additional six to eight damage while being on the cusp of a combo kill, say 38 life. As any Kano player knows, it's really hard to kill from 38, even if your opponent taps out, because not only will you need the wildfire and it'll have to be exactly lessons or a spindle combo, but then also the spindle would have to find the blazing. And then on top of that, you also need the rare 13 resource threshold to be able to afford it. So all the stars need to align for Kano. And when the chances of something like this happening are so small like this, it is in most cases simply correct to just get your six to eight damage with your last card and force me to have the nuts. Trying to play around the nut draws is a great way to win the battle, but lose the war. And then last point on this, just having this mindset makes these high roll losses feel a lot more manageable as well. Just because I'm able to remember that in the long run, my nut draws will offset my opponent's nut draws. But the next tip is, we have two opponents every game. Every time you sit down for a game of flesh and blood, you have two opponents. One is the player across from you and the other one is your own deck. Now, of course you can blame a loss on your bad draws and leave it at that but for me, that's not gonna cut it. Instead, I have a couple tips when it comes to deck building that actually help this problem drastically. So my main goal is to increase the floor of my deck rather than the ceiling. This both improves the consistency while also lessens the impact of worst case scenarios so that I don't just lose to myself in a game that I should win. So first I try to fill my deck with cards that are good on their own. Cards that don't require other cards to be good can fit nicely into any hand size have immediate impact when I play them or block with them, etc, etc. If a card can fill all these requirements, or just a couple, while being synergistic with the rest of the cards, that gets a golden star from me and just goes straight into the deck. Next, I urge people to try and figure out your real preferred blue count. Ask yourself, how many blues do you want to draw every hand if you could choose? Then take that number, put it into a hypogeometric calculator to find how many you need in your deck in order to maximize your chances on drawing that specific number. And then I even go as far as to up that count by one or two. I do this because I combine it with the next step of playing the highest impact blues rather than the niche case use ones. This is the hedge for when I have tempo and then I draw into a full blue hand that hopefully my blues can still be able to do something impactful and not just lose me the game on the spot. Last thing I want to add to this is weapons have a huge impact on this tip. Decks like Guardians, Warriors, and Control Dash, for example, have great weapons, so they can get away with running tech blue cards, as at worst case, they can just be pitched into their strong weapons. So decks without a strong weapon, I really urge that you try and abuse this tip. So remember, you'd rather increase your floor than your ceiling. But going into the next one, tip number six is 
actually a system I use for effective playtesting. So there's been recent chats about the need to be in a testing team to be successful at Flesh and Blood. And while I'm not disputing the advantages of being in a team, I will say as someone who lives in Australia and my entire team are 12 to 16 hours different time zones from me, I'm very often left to testing by myself. So I wanted to give some tips on how to have effective testing in both a team setting and solo bolo. So I'm gonna start off with my steps on what your aim should be when testing for a matchup specifically to find out who's actually favored in any matchup. And then I'll explain it in both the team setting and how to do a solo. So my first First step is before playing, what are the possible narratives on how one deck could beat the other? So for this entire thing, I'm going to use the example of Azalea Kano matchup, where Kano's win con's pretty one dimensional, it's just comboing, while Azalea wins by keeping Kano off of an arsenal with their inertias and seek and destroys, or killing him faster than he can combo, or ideally both simultaneously. And then on to the next step once you have those narratives. Now we can run the matchup a couple times, trying to find the winning patterns. So here you want to jot down quick notes how each game played. In my team's Discord, we actually have a results tab, which I recommend everyone do. But these notes are really quick, just noting the important things from the early turns. For example, it will look like Azalea on play, W, Dominate Inertia turn 0, Kano weak turn 1, Azalea big turn two. Turn three Kano, average turn, set up Arsenal. Azalea force combo, able to AB, GG. Or on the flip side, Kano on the play, W, finds potion, set Arsenal, draw into combo. Azalea present arrow with inertia. Kano combo in response. Azalea next turn, weak because no Arsenal. Kano four card hand, into flipping Azalea's turn for win. So really simple, just a couple sentences, and you just repeat that process like, I'd say 10 times is decent to find the winning patterns. And then onto the next step, now we assess those winning patterns for each hero. So for this matchup, I found that Azalea had to dominate an Arsenal disruption on their first or second turn, while Kano had to have an almost all red hand for Azalea to win, while Kano just had to set up a combo before the effect triggers. So pretty simple, we know the winning patterns, but the next step is the fun one. So based on the winning patterns, how do we improve the matchup for each side? So say Azalea has a winning pattern of dominate disruption early, how can Kano win through this? So if Kano has the combo there and then, he should just shoot and play a post combo game, which is favorable for him, thanks to Azalea's low AB and low blue count. But now, how can Azalea play around that? Well, maybe she's meant to hold back an extra card to make sure she takes the least amount of damage and hopefully keep an arsenal. This significantly aids her in her ability to win the post-combo game against Kano. And now, back to Kano. How does he beat Azalea if she presents the Dominate Disruption early and keeps an extra card? Well now, if he combos Azalea, he lets her use that ip card efficiently for that turn cycle. So if Kano instead arsenals a Flare or a Blazing over his Wildfire, it actually became better for him to use his Striders for a combo on his own turn, as this often did a boatload of damage while not allowing for that quote unquote free AB from Azalea, making her suffer from that IP from the previous turn. And just keep continuing to build this flowchart of if X then Y, and then you just continue this for each type of start that both heroes can have in the game. Make sure to take notes of blowouts as well, because these are really good indicators on who's actually favored in the matchup due to having just something that can happen that's pretty much uncounterable and wins on the spot. Also, consider sideboarding options as well and how they can fit into these patterns. And then that's pretty much how you find out how to actually play a matchup. And so now, of course, having a teammate help you with the testing is great for an outside perspective and such but I often use the system playing against myself as I know I'll play the game optimally since I have perfect information of the game. So my biggest tip to people who don't have a team or a high level local area is either proxying the decks you wanna test against and then playing against yourself or even just having two separate Talashar accounts and fighting yourself online. So just using these steps, you can easily find out how to play and tech for each matchup without a team. So yeah, that's... Tip number six, effective playtesting. But then next up we have tip number seven, which is remember, cards don't have equal value throughout a game. So I tactically placed this tip after the playtesting one, as this one makes much more sense when understanding 
winning patterns for matchups. And a major thing you'll notice is some patterns will be true if you draw X card on turn zero, turn one, but if you draw it on turn two, turn three instead, the pattern is much more different or in some cases straight up not true anymore. I have a theory that this is because of the draw mechanics in Flesh and Blood with both players seeing a lot more cards as opposed to other TCGs. So the patterns become a lot more nuanced. To give an example of this, if we follow the previous Kano Azalea matchup, the pattern of Azalea Dominate Inertia turn one being a heavily favored game state for her if played correctly. If she instead drew the Inertia on turn three, well now Kano has gotten her down into the low 30s or she had to give up a card so she can't hold that extra one while she dominates. This all giving Kano a really good chance to win through the winning pattern for Azalea, even though it was just one turn different. That's why I argue that the turn in which you see a card determines its true value that game. Another great example for this is Levi's Blood Rush Bellow turns. In our testing, we found that a game against Levi who Blood Rushes turn one or turn two is 10 times harder to beat compared to a Levi that does not see Blood Rush early, simply due to her need to fill graveyard. So that's why it's really important to understand both what are the important cards and the ideal turns each hero wants them by. So hopefully this tip shows you just how much a card's value can increase or decrease based on the turn, which should help you immensely in figuring out each hero's winning pattern from any point within the game. But this has been a big video, so last tip is to make sure you have fun. Now I know it's cliche, we've all heard it before, but things that are cliche are only that because, well, they're true. And to back that, it's actually scientifically proven that enjoyment levels in activities lead to enhanced engagement, improved learning, increased motivation and boosted creativity. And personally, that's why I initially chose Kano as my main hero because Across everything, I enjoy the difficult task the most because of the required engagement and attention to be able to perform said tasks, along with the rewarding feeling after doing it. So not only should you have fun, but I think it's important to try and learn about yourself a little bit here, figure out what you find fun and why, because it will directly correlate to your results in this game. But the tips don't end here. Check out these videos next if you're seriously trying to improve at flesh and blood and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.